Hello, and welcome to my presentation about troubleshooting at sea and how we at Sofar Ocean Technologies troubleshoot of our devices remotely without you know, having physical access to them. Very quickly, uh, some of these slides are going to have a lot of text and, and some more technical stuff. I'm not going to cover them in detail. Uh, we're going to have a kind of a supplementary blog post available once the pres this presentation is live. So take a look at that for all the links and extra details on the presentation. About me, uh, my name is Alvaro. I have been a firmware engineer for over 10 years now. I've been working at Sofar Ocean Technologies for over a year now, and I've worked at some of these other companies you might recognize um, in the past eh, for a while. Um, I also, I'm slightly obsessed with cheese. And unfortunately, this is not what this presentation is about, but if you ever see me in person, I will be more than happy to talk to you about it. All right, so very quickly, let me tell you about the company I work for uh, so far, just to give you background onto what we do, which is kind of gonna explain the rest. So, so far Ocean Technologies, I'm just gonna say so far from now on, is a company that's basically in the ocean data as a service kind of industry. So we make our own sensors, these uh, buoys that are called spotters. And these spotters get deployed all over the ocean, also uh, drifting around or moored. Um, customers can purchase them or we have our own. This data is wave heights, winds, temperatures, and, and other kind of atmospheric measurements. And we receive all this data over satellite. We put it into uh, some algorithms, and we're able to produce a better weather forecasts where we have a ship routing service, and we also provide the, the data to scientists and, and, and things like that. So here is a map of some of these, the location of some of these spotter buoys that we have. And as you can see, they're all over the place. And as this uh, presentation is titled, how would we figure out what's wrong with some of these units if they're in the middle of the Pacific? We're never going to see this unit again, so how do you troubleshoot it? All right, so the way I've structured this presentation is we're going to go through the development, the whole development cycle of one of these, the next generation spotter buoy. So we're going to start in the lab and then until we deploy it in the ocean, and at each step of the way, we're going to have different tools at our disposal to troubleshoot and, and debug and develop. And we're kind of going to cover that. All right, so just meet Spotter. This is our protagonist. Uh, it, the next generation is going to have an STM32L4 Cortex-M4F processor. It's got GPS. It's got a satellite modem. It's got an SD card for logging. It's got a bunch of different sensors. And that's what we're going to be dealing with. Here's um, Spotter has a sibling that's called Smart Mooring, and it's basically Spotter with a kind of an umbilical cord down below that allows other sensors to, to, to be connected. Here is a photo of one of our customers deploying some of these buoys in the Arctic Ocean. As you can imagine, you know, these get deployed, and that's the last we see of them. We'll hopefully hear them for a while, but you know, sometimes things, things go wrong, and we need to figure out as much as we can so we can improve the product uh, over time. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Before we ever have any hardware of our own, I always tell people to, well, okay, first we're gonna assume we've already selected a Cortex-M processor um, ahead of time. Then before we ever get our own circuit boards with kind of all the things that we need, I always recommend to use a development board from one of these vendors. So in our example is the ST Micro Nucleo boards. And the, the goal here is to be able, as a firmware engineer, to write as much as the code that we're going to use ahead of time. So I can use one of these boards. I can test my entire tool chain. I can test programming. I can test all these different things ahead of time. Other thing I like to emphasize is set up a reproducible build system. This is going to be very important later on when you're trying to reproduce uh, field failures in the lab. And if you are unable to basically reproduce exactly the image that is in the field, you're going to have a really hard time uh, doing that. And, and again, uh, there's links 
or there's going to be links to uh, articles and how to do all these things. All right, so let's set the stage. We are now in the office or in the lab or at home in these cases, and we have a custom development board for the next version of Spotter, and we can connect everything, right? So, so here's here's a picture. You see, there's test points all around. There's cables, components. This is the best situation for for development and debug. We when we have access to this, the the, the you know, the gold standard is JTAG slash SWD, single wire debug. You can flash the device, you can step through the code, you can read memory, add breakpoints, watch points, capture like entire contents of RAM. And then you can use tools such as GDB, uh, uh, Segar's Ozone, uh, Eclipse for visual debugging. It's, you know, it's the best. I'm personally a much bigger fan of GDB. It's just what I'm comfortable with, but you know, whatever tool you're familiar with, is going to be the best tool. Um, yeah, so stepping through the code, all this stuff is, is kind of the best. Here's a, a photo of one of the devices that I was instrumenting. I forget what I was troubleshooting, but you know, being able to hook up, in this case, I have a Salier logic analyzer, and it just saves you so much time when you can just look at the signals, figure out what's wrong, instead of trying, trying to guess. So some tips and tricks, I'm not going to cover all of these, but one of the, my favorites is that when with the Cortex M processors, you can actually you, you know when there's a debugger attached, and you can make a choice that when you hit, for example, an, an assert statement, you can set a breakpoint only if the debugger is attached. So if the there's no debugger, when you hit assert, it'll just restart. This is what you want for production. You don't want to just get stuck there. But if you have a debugger attached, oh, you can automatically hit a breakpoint and then go analyze, see, see what's going on. Um, there's there's a lot of cool features like that that, that help in, in development. All right, so we have JTAG, we have access to all the tools. This is amazing, right? But we got to keep going. Now, you know, our designers, mechanical engineers are like, hey, let's get an enclosure on this thing. You know, we want to see what it looks like. So now you have an enclosure, you start getting limited. We, you can't poke at all the test points, you know, you might not be able to connect JTAG or SLED. So what are we left with? Uh, here's an example. This is a 3D printed enclosure for, for our spotter kind of electronics. So we're left with serial USB. I mean, USB is serial. Uh, uh, a UART or USB is very common nowadays. And of course, the most popular way of debugging is printfs, right? So you just uh, print over the serial port whatever information you want. Other very useful things are command line interfaces. And I have another slide on this that, that can be very, very useful. Um, using asserts again and, and fault hooks, the, the, there's ways to, when you hit a hard fault or some other assert to basically capture the, the current state of the registers and figure out what went wrong. And then next time you reconnect, it can print out that information, or at least tell you kind of where, uh, where the problem happens. If you have enough space, you can do full core dumps, and I'm going to talk about those later. They're amazing. All right, command line interfaces, to me, are one of the most useful because they're flexible, and you know you, you only need your serial to, to to use them, right? I I like to implement generic accessors to everything. So, for example, I have a, a way to toggle each GPIO with uh, USB commands. Uh, send I squared C SBI or just serial data in any of the buses over USB. And that way I can test all the hardware peripherals without having had the code, all the drivers written ahead of time, right? I can just send the actual raw I squared C command over USB. Very useful. You can, if, you, if you're brave, you can do a peek and poke. So you can read and write arbitrary memory. This is not good for security, but for, for troubleshooting debugging, it's, it's a great way to, to get around there. Also, getting into the bootloader, having a command to do that is, is very uh, useful. So you don't have to actually hold a button down. And again, with great power comes great responsibility. These commands you know, can be dangerous, but can be very useful during troubleshooting. All right, so we've done a lot of lab testing. We're fairly comfortable with this. It's time to start testing the spotters in a more realistic environment, aka the water. So and <laughs> here's, here's a picture of one of our spotter buoys, right? Um, so 
actually, here, here, here we go. They, they are testing site. Um, is for example, it's an ocean beach. It's maybe an hour, hour and a half boat ride from the office. You can see the Golden Gate in the background. And yeah, it's, it's not super remote, but it does take some planning and it takes time to go retrieve them, right? So what are our options here? Satellite data, yes, we can, we can get data over satellite, but it's very expensive. So it's, it's good for status updates, some of the sensor data but you're not gonna be doing printf debugging over satellite. That's unless, <laughs> unless you wanna spend a lot of money. So in our case, we have an SD card. So we can continue to do all those printf logs, saving them to a file. And that way, if something goes wrong, we can go retrieve the buoy, get it back, and look at the logs and try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, the more data that you have, usually the easier time you're gonna have figuring out what went wrong when something does go wrong. So blog as much as, as you can, as, as much as practical, but keep in mind that sometimes logging can cause more problems. So for example, an SD card, it's gonna use more power. Uh, sometimes it's gonna add delays because once you're saving you know, logs to files, every time you're doing that, it's gonna be adding delays. And depending on how you structure your code, you might be making things worse or um, kind of solving your problem. Sometimes you know, you'll have an issue and then you put a printf and then it works again and then you remove it. You have, we call these Heisen bugs, right? When you instrument it and it starts working again. Just be aware of these things. All right, so, oh I, yeah, throughout this uh, presentation, I'm also gonna show you some example bugs that we've caught at different points in time. So during one of our field tests, we caught a bug that we would have never caught if we had only tested this in the office. So the unit was working just fine in the office. And then we went out to Ocean Beach to deploy it. And as we did, the GPS position was reporting completely incorrect. So you can see here all the way, well, not on the well on the right, there's three yellow dots. The rightmost dot is by the office. Then the middle dot is where the buoy actually was. And then the one all the way on the left near those little islands is where the unit said it was, which is not correct. And so we went, uh, I think it restarted and then the, the values were correct again, which was very strange. So we went out, we retrieved the unit, we got the SD card and we looked at the logs. And the logs had the correct position the whole time. So the GPS was working correctly, but somehow the data we were getting back was incorrect. And it turned out to be a bug in the uh, bit packing code we have. When we send data over satellite, we kind of pack the data as much as we can to save on data costs. And there was like a weird bug that would set once but never clear zero. So as the unit moved, the ones would kind of get stock on and then the position would get kind of moved around. This is something we could have only caught by moving the unit geographically, like physically moving it um, in, in, in space. And so, so this was a very useful testing that, that we were able to get. This is, uh, now I'm gonna cover a different bug. And this is a bug that we caught on a unit that was deployed and then we were able to reproduce locally. And for this one, we, I'm using a tool, kind of a framework called Memfault. It's a service that, that, that we use at work. And you're able to send kind of a reduced crash data, or in this case, just a reset. Uh, whenever a reset occurs, we send like the, the PC and the, the program counter and the link register uh, over, along with the firmware version with the serial number of the device. And as you can see here, there was in a log printf function, there was an assert and in line 51, right? So I could go look at the code and what the code said was, hey, there was an assert because we tried to malloc, so we tried to allocate some memory, we couldn't, so we crashed. And we're just letting you know. And again, this is a unit in the water, and so all we know right now is that, hey, uh, we ran out of memory. So I was able to reproduce this with a unit in the lab, and this unit had an SD card attached, and when, thankfully, we have enough memory right now that we're able to do entire core dumps when a crash occurs. So we save all 320 kilobytes of RAM into flash. And once the unit restarts, it saves that core dump into, into the SD card. Then I'm able to upload that into this memfault service. And 
in, and now I had previously uploaded the L file, so the, all the symbols for, for, for the code. And now I get an entire picture of the state of the system, which is incredible for debugging, right? So you can see here exactly which line. I can see the entire stack, the, all the, the function calls that happened before. I can see what all the other tasks were doing, which can be useful. And then I can download you know, that core dump and put into GDB, which is, which is what I did. So, so we had a failure in the field. We were able to reproduce it with the exact same firmware version in the lab, do a full core dump, and then start looking at it, right? So this is where I used the GDB Python extension, and I wrote a script to walk through the heap and basically try to figure out what, what's using up all my memory, right? So, so first, I look, at the, I look at the heap here, and I see all the free blocks that, that we have. So OK, yeah, very clearly, there's not a lot of memory available. Then I was like, OK, can I print out all the allocated memory? And there was a way to do that. So I started doing that, and then I see all the allocations. It looks you know, pretty normal right now. And then I look at the end, and there's a ton of allocations that are just one kilobyte long, which is a little suspicious. I have lots of those. So then I modify the script yet again to actually print out the values in this allocated memory. And <laughs> when I looked, I was uh, a little upset with myself, but it's a bunch of zeros. It's, it's a print statement. When, you know, we saw this, this crash was in the log print function. And then you can see there's a serial a transmit overflow and then a bunch of zeros. So now we know exactly what's going on. There is, when you unplug USB, if there's any logs kind of waiting to be printed out, they would try to get printed out. The buffer would overflow because they, you know, USB is not emptying it out. And then, because I'm smart, <laughs> I would print a, a message that says, hey, we're overflowing this, this uh, serial buffer. Unfortunately, that message gets printed in the same way that it's causing the problem, and, and it starts kind of just looping. And the log printing function are, allocates 1K. It doesn't do this anymore. It used to allocate like a whole kilobyte, um, regardless of how big the, the print was. So, so with this, you know, I was able to narrow down the problem and fix it very quickly. All right, so now we've done a lot of more testing. We've done testing in the field, you know, the local field. Time to set these uh, buoys free. So how do we get these in the middle of the ocean? In many cases, some of our, our customers or partners will basically help us throw these off the side of a boat uh, when they're crossing the ocean, right? So here's one of our buoys getting uh, tossed on the side. So, OK, we are now in the middle of the ocean. We still have satellite communication. We no longer have SD cards, right? We're never going to see these units again, so there's no point logging to the SD card. Um, and again, the satellite data is pretty expensive. So one of the ways we are able to reduce our costs is through bit packing, right? So if, if a certain sensor measurement only uses, let's say, 10 bits of data, you're not going to use a 16-bit number to do that. We're going to pack it down to 10 bits. And, and, and this is very data efficient, but it's not very flexible, right? If we ever need to change a field or add one, we need to first know exactly what version of the packet we're sending, and then we need to decode it properly. So very efficient, not very flexible. And then one of the ways we were able to kind of sneak miscellaneous information out is, uh, let's say we had four bytes of data uh, left in each packet. And so I added a counter, a one byte counter, and then three bytes of miscellaneous data. And then that counter kind of tells you what the data is. And we're able to kind of extract some like system uptime, the reset reason, some firmware versions, that kind of thing. Um, some of the data we sent is some of the sensor data. And, and here's an example of a, uh, a leak. Uh, usually, <laughs> you don't want water inside of these buoys, so we have an internal humidity sensor. And here you can see the, the humidity kind of rising over time, which means the water coming in. And there's not much we could do about it, but, but it'll tell us, and then we can figure out you know, which batch of units this was from, and then kind of go from there. I mentioned before that I was using this service called Memfault, and that's another alternative uh, that's very useful for field deployment. And for remote data sending, it's a little bit, it uses a little bit more data, but it's extremely flexible. So, so we had the previous bit packing where it's extremely efficient, not very flexible. 
this is an option that is still very efficient. It uses kind of a, a Seaboard-like binary packing, but in a um, very flexible kind. Like you don't need to change the, the you know the both sides of the code. It, it, again, it uses the the symbols file to, to decode the data. It can uh, we used before. It can send the the PC LR, but you can also send like kind of reduced. Uh, core dumps. So if you only want to capture a stack trace of the particular task when it crashes, you might only send a few hundred bytes or, or like maybe one kilobyte. It's still, it's not, it's not a super cheap, but in certain cases you can enable it and, and get a much more detailed um, crash information. You can also, they, they have some cool ways of getting error messages back without actually sending them. It's more like a tokenized system where you can print like, oh, the, the I don't know, GPS error one, two, three. And it only sends kind of the information of like where that happened. And then it was able to provide me, the user, with the actual detailed print without sending it out, which is which is pretty cool. One of the other ways to kind of troubleshoot systems is just with metrics, right? We don't have the SD card logs, so we're just relying on the information we've been sending and, and receiving. So having all this data, or like I said before, the more data we have, the, the easier it is to figure out what went wrong. If it, even if a unit stops transmitting, we can go and look back as like, okay, what was it transmitting before, before it died, right? So we can, we can kind of see that. Here's an example of the wave heights and other kind of, like a dashboard that we have uh, that, that kind of tells you what's going on with a particular unit um, anywhere in the world, right? Okay, so I keep saying metrics, right? And, 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 and you know, we have some of our own metrics that we were sending with all our bit packing, and then we're also using memfault for, for some of the more variable uh, metrics, like the, the ones that aren't, that we don't know about beforehand. So an example is uh, we have a buoy that's in the water. This one happened to be in the field, but still in the one that we could go recover but it starts reporting very high temperatures, uh, very high power consumption, right? And, and then it just stops working. So we look at the, the logs of the data we've received and we see the surface temperature, the sea surface temperature was around 40 degrees Celsius, which is way too warm for San Francisco uh, weather. And then because of that, we, we suspect that, oh, and the power consumption just went shot through the roof. So Having those two pieces of data, we start suspecting the sea surface temperature sensor probably developed a short, and then the short circuit caused heat, and then it heated up the sensor, caused power consumption, and you know, so, so you can see here, you, you, you can see the temperature in the top left, and then you can see the, the power that's negative because it's the battery discharging, and you can see it like one and a half watts is way too much for, for our application. So, by just looking at the, the, the metrics coming back from this unit, we are able to fairly certainly determine that this unit had a short circuit on the temperature sensor. We later were able to recover this unit, and we were able to confirm that that was the issue, which was pretty cool. Because we recovered this unit, and this was a test unit, we also had SD card data, which has a lot more detail. So now we have not only the battery power, but we have all these other buses um, and, and, and we can see with much more detail what was going on at high resolution, high data rate. Here you can see the temperature sensor just like shoot, shoot, shoot to the roof. Uh, so, so, so this is a great example of how we, you know, we found a problem that could have been in the middle of the ocean. We could have told you what happened and then thankfully we were able to recover it and, and, and see what was up. Other cool metrics that, that I've been playing with, uh, for example, is this one that's the time the radio the radio modem which is their satellite modem stays on and this basically is the data from three separate devices that is telling you how long the modem was enabled and trying to send a message every six hours because we only we don't want to send this very often so every six hours and in this case it's one of the memfault uh, metrics I send an update and this tells you how hard a time the the satellite modems having transmitting this data. So the unfortunately, the, the, the scales aren't the same, but you can see the bottom right one is in the order of 34 million uh, units of time. I think it's in milliseconds. 
and the other two are much lower. And in this case, the one on the bottom right is a unit that's here in my apartment, you know, with buildings around, so it has a really hard time transmitting that data. Versus the other two that are out, outside and, and, and have a clear view of the sky, much easier time transmitting. So this, in the field, could tell us if, if um, certain units are having issues, you know, transmitting, and, and if there's bad coverage, if there's interference, jamming, whatever you want to call it, right? Oh, yeah, so that's uh, this is coming to an end now. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so kind of some of the takeaways I, I want to leave you with is do as much of debugging, troubleshooting as you can earlier on while you have the units in the lab, right? Of course, duh. Um, beware of instrumentation crossing problems. You know, sometimes logging can be as much a problem as the solution. So just be, just be aware of it. So when you do run into an issue, you know, check, oh, am I causing the issue by trying to measure it? Or if you fix it by measuring it, you know, something else is wrong. Um, send as much data as you can, but, you know, I'm being realistic, you can't because there's, there's a, data is expensive to, to send over, you know, especially over satellite. And then also keep in mind your power. But the more data you have, usually the, the more information you're gonna have to figure out what's wrong. You can also, try to throttle that data. You know, if you have development units, so it's like, hey, let's spend more money on these just to kind of get an idea of what's going on and then we can turn it down once we're more comfortable or confident in our, in our you know, system. And also, as I mentioned before, get as much testing in realistic conditions as you can. We wouldn't have caught this GPS bug if we hadn't physically moved this unit all around. Like there's an example, I think it was the F-22s or a uh, fighter plane when it flew across the date line it actually crashed because <laughs> their soft, they, they never tested that. And, and so it, it didn't physically crash, but the software, I think, rebooted. So make sure you test um, all this in the conditions, as close to the conditions you can imagine, because a lot of the failures just don't show up in the lab. Anyway, I'd love to keep talking to you about this. If you ever want to talk about this, I am, you know, send me a message. Uh, you can email me, you can find me on Twitter as well. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And that's all I have for now. Again, look forward to a blog post about the topic with uh, links to all the things and hopefully a lot more details. So thank you.